Oh, it's a good turnout. <laughs> How many of you guys saw that for the first time? I feel like there was a... Oh, oh wow. quite a few. Hey, cool. Amazing. <laughs> wow, that's, I'm so excited for you. <laughs> this, uh, I, I, this is part of a series that we run here called Movies We Love. Mm. And uh, I picked this film because I think it's one of the most creative things I have ever seen across any mediums. I just think it's just every detail in this film is exceptional. Um, but I thought maybe we could start talking a bit about how it came together uh, in its original form from the script phase because uh, it went through various various writers, each with a particular voice. So t yeah. tell us a little bit about how um, how it started in terms of uh, the germ of the idea, but then also what writers like Terry Jones and uh, Elaine May brought to the project. Oh, you know about that. <laughs> Is that, how did you know about that? I, don't, I thought it was always secret that Elaine May was involved. Um, it's, uh, it was at the time. Um, I can't, you know, I can't really tell, I can tell you uh, quite a bit. I was young. I was 21 or so when we made the movie. So, I, and I was a, a b big into special effects puppets and doing that stuff. And I was really the puppet coordinator and I was helping to organize all of that stuff. So my... My relationship to the script was really as Jim's son, mm -hmm. and um, and I was uh, part of the who should play Jareth. That was the kind of yes. a, a big part, and he was like, "You're 21. I need to know who you wish was playing Jareth." And I was like, <laughs> he, he, "He wanted." I was Sting, like David right? Bowie, and he was like, "Not not Michael Jackson." I was like, David <laughs> Bowie, um, but um, no, but but I do I can tell you some of what went on. Brian Froud will tell the story differently, so I'm not really entirely sure, but after Dark Crystal, I do know that the feeling was, the film was received as a little bit too dry, a little too esoteric, um, and that people basically came out of Dark Crystal going, wow, it's fantastic, but where's that Henson, mm, where's the zany, people always say zany, and the Muppets, really, my dad's work was never zany. It was kind of wild, wild. There was a bit of a uh, calculated abandon to, to his to the energy, but um, so that was the idea. Was we what the imagination that he was applying to Dark Crystal? Can we do that? But can we have the funny back? Can we have all that back? So um, the story, the basic idea of the story came from my father with Brian Froud and the you know the idea of the the, the you know the Sarah the lead struggling between being a child and being an adult and wishing she was an adult, but when she's treated as an adult, the, how it backfires and, and all of that was sort of gathering momentum. And I was doing other movies at the time. When I first went over to London, I was working for a few different people. Speaking uh, of which, a prior Movies We Love was Return to Oz. Yeah, Return, Return to Oz yeah. I did before this, which is, yeah, great. And I, <laughs> and I, wish, Wal I wish Walter Murch had directed again it was you know he's really extraordinarily talented man really amazing his brain the way but he, that was a hard work for him the whole studio thing was very hard for him to maneuver but at one point when it got really hard he called his friends on return to oz and oh, we, we came to work one morning and we thought walter was going to get fired because the studio was around and we came to work in george lucas and steven spielberg <laughs> and um <laughs> Oh, and Francis Coppola, we're all there, sitting in chairs, to support Walter. And all they did the whole time was talk about their phones. Because, <laughs> of course, they were all beta testing the newest phone. But they were lovely, and they were there to support Walter, and then he made the picture. And it's a really great film. It really is very uh, faithful to what Frank Baum intended Wizard of Oz to be. Um, uh, uh, but now, going back to wait, Labyrinth. Wait, wait, so but, uh, odd side note, I, I accidentally invited the producer that fired him to the Q&A that Walter was at. Oh, and you so did they told the story from both sides. How Fantastic. <laughs> but then he got fired because then Walter got to stay. No, I guess he did sort of stay. I'm wondering which producer you oh, mean. Paul Mislang. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, it was Paul. Okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, you did. That was good. Wow. That must have been fun. 
Um, so then on Labyrinth, so then my dad went to he, he, Ch Terry Jones, who was a huge fan of, of all things Monty Python, and, and had, you know, basically all those Monty Python guys at some point had done something with the Muppets. And Terry really wanted to do it, and he wrote a really funny script that um, everyone loved, that had story problems, I guess you could call them problems, story weaknesses. And, and I still think the film today has story weakness. As I watch it, I feel like mm, it's still, there is weakness to the story. So, um, but Terry came in and he did a, a really fantastic work, working with, I feel like they were almost in a room together for a long time, my dad and Terry. And they came up with what was a really, really funny uh, script where the story uh, needed some structure. And then, um, I don't know how much of this, I was just telling you this, and now I'm like, oh, you asked the question. I was like, I should tell you that. I'm, I shouldn't really. But anyway, my father went to, he asked advice from somebody, and, and, and a writer off of Fraggle Rock came in, Laura Phillips, and helped with the structure. But she couldn't resist, and as often happens, and I say this to people all the time now, I say, if you're doing a comedy, don't write jokes. Just write the story, write the story, write the story, write the story. Stop. You can write jokes because you want it to be funny, but don't get attached to any of it because you have to get the story exactly right before you then make it funny because when you're trying to restructure something, it's almost impossible to retain the comedy. And so what happened was the restructuring of Labyrinth was then happening and and as often happens when you're restructuring, you're ch slightly changing character arcs, you're slightly changing story beats, it unravels all the dialogue. So, so then what happened was he now had a piece that was sort of structural and was not funny anymore. So uh, Elaine came in, and again, I'm surprised you know that, because I, I, I'm sure it was a, she was not meant to be there. <laughs> She flew in in the dark of night and stayed in our house <laughs> and worked like in an upper room, you know. But um, she um, she just worked with my father. Uh, I I can't remember two or three days flat out to try to bring back the comedy but retain the better structure. And all this was happening when we were not far out from shooting. We were real close to shooting, and um, and then what came out. So then Elaine had done that work with my dad and then Terry came back in. I think I think my father didn't want to bring Terry back in on the first restructured script because it was like all this stuff was gone. Um, and then he came back in and worked with it and um, and then that's how we ended up here. But it was a sort of slightly convoluted process um, of, of how it got there. But I do think it del the movie does definitely have that that joy um, that is Jim Henson, and yet it's cool and it's naughty with with David Bowie. And David Bowie's pants are naughty. <laughs> well, you should have seen Brian's drawings. Brian's designs was like that codpiece just got bigger and bigger. And, and my dad was like, "This is great. It's like terrifying to a teenage girl." It's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That was what he was, because he was like, this is great, this is what the movie's about, you know, she's like 15, she wants to be treated like an adult, but whoa, <laughs> that thing's scary. 